All right, we're in Numbers chapter 16 this evening. Uh, Our text, we're going to be focusing on verses 1 through 11. Numbers 16, verse 1 says, Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And then, and when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him, even him who he had chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do, take ye censers, Korah and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi." And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, you sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you, that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel, to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. And he hath brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also? For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord, and what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? Let's open a word of prayer. Lord, as we bow before you, help us as we consider these things. Lord, be with the needs in our church, with the health health of those, and be with our missionaries, and be with those traveling, Lord, as uh, they're dealing with various family things. We pray, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified, and help us as we consider your word today, and may it be Uh, applicable, and may it instruct us, and may we be holy and righteous in all manner of living, we pray. Amen. As we look here, we're going to be looking at the grumbling against Aaron, but on May 7, 2019, in a USA Today article, there was a crashed Aerofloat plane that killed 41 of the passengers on board, and Bill McGee wrote, reports from people on the plane indicate the evacuation may have been slowed by passengers grabbing their bags. Videos show passengers taking their carry-on bags with them as they exited the plane. The AFA said in a statement, We will never know if more lives could have been saved if the bags were left behind. In Luke 12, 15, Jesus says, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. The the, The NASB translates the first part of this verse, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. And watching those video footages of those passengers making an emergency exit with carry-ons in hand is a rather graphic illustration of Jesus's point. Unfortunately, we do the same thing when we have the wrong priorities. We allow all of the earthly things to get in the way. Paul describes these snares as plunging men into ruin and destruction that pierces them through with many griefs in 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. It's interesting that Paul's inspired counsel is to flee from these things in verse 11. And as we think about this, we need to be careful not to allow the world to cloud our judgment, making the things of this world seem more important than the eternal values, which really are important. And that's really what's going on here with Korah, as he and his friends allowed what they desired to become more important than what God had laid down. And they... Uh, approach this in a very, uh, well, shall we say, nifty way of approaching the the gospel from their own perspective. As we talked about the main ringleaders last week, uh, we introduced them and their behaviors and how they disrupted and how they they were problematic and all the problems they caused. We're now looking at their argument against Aaron. And first, I want you to see how they misinterpreted scripture uh, in verse 3. It focuses on the rivalry expressed between Korah and Moses, and it defends, Moses is defending the high priest, which is his brother Aaron. And, you know, um, he says, who is Aaron that you should grumble against him in verse 11? And a number of features in this complaint narrative, and, and again, I want to use the narrative 
as opposed to a story, because people think of stories as made up. You know, it's a, it's a Bible story, or, or we're going to talk story, and, and it's just, you know, we're going we're gonna to tell lies. No, no, the Bible is a narrative. This is history. This is fact. It's beyond doubt. And uh, as we look at this, we're going to encounter leadership issues, and we have an example of how they misinterpreted Scripture. The grumblers told Moses that the whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them in verse 3. And that sounds a lot like other theories that I've heard floating in the church age today. Not so much in our church, but I've heard it in the years gone by that, uh, you know, uh, we're all equals. We're all holy. We we all can, we're all, we don't need to submit. We don't need to obey. We can do what we want to do. And uh, that's just not the point, okay? And while we're all equal before God in our need of salvation, we're all equal in God, in our redemption, how we're all equal at the cross, but that's a a misconstrual of God's plan. And that's kind of the same thing going on here, where Korah lays out his own agenda. And remember, Moses, in general, would have agreed with his accusers. In general, he'd have said, yeah, we're all holy to the Lord. Yeah, the Lord is with all of us. Yes, the Lord is the one that goes with us. In general, Moses would have agreed, but in practice, He was in very much disagreement. Uh, Remember that this tassels that we had just studied recently in the book of Matthew and even had just laid out in in, uh, Numbers chapter 15, it was an encouragement to personal holiness. And so they were to obey the Lord's commands. In verse 40, it says that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto the Lord. And by obeying God's commands, they would be holy. It's not that you're holy and you get to break God's commands. It's No, it's by obeying his commands, you are holy. And so holiness sounds bad. It almost comes across that if you're trying to be holy, you're against everything else, and it's become a negative connotation in the world today. But holiness is not so much I'm against or I'm away from everything, but rather I'm separated to something. And holiness is being separated to God. And you say, well, how does that relate to life? Simple. You have things that are holy in your own lives, like my toothbrush is holy. That is the only thing I allow my toothbrush to be used for, is for holy purposes, that is brushing my teeth. Um, uh, Toothbrushes are wonderful instruments for polishing shoes. They're wonderful. I've used them recently on on degunking a, a carburetor on multiple engines like lawnmowers and generators, and they're wonderful at getting paint out of surfaces you're trying to get paint out of. But never did I use that toothbrush with carb cleaner and degreaser and paint remover and gunk all over it and say, huh, maybe I'll brush my teeth with it. Or use that same toothbrush with shoe polish on it and say, huh, maybe I'll brush my teeth with it. That is contradictory to what I'm trying to accomplish in cleaning my mouth. And if you've ever had gasoline or any of those other cleaners in your mouth, you understand you can't wait to get it out of your mouth. And as we Consider what is before us. The same concept is here is that we are separated unto God. Korah uses holiness unto God as justification for rebelling against God and his plan. And we need to avoid anything that grieves God. It's amazing how they disregarded their work in verses 8 and 9. And then they coveted the work of others in verse 10. How they disobeyed God in verse 11. They gossiped and disrespected God's leaders in verse 11b. Holiness was more of a hashtag to these guys than it was a real lifestyle. You know, it was something they were fond about. It was something they would tag and say, look, look, I'm being holy. But they didn't live it. Their life was not displaying it. It was something they talked about, but it was not something they lived. And so more than a few issues come up when Christians on either side of an issue start using verses that are, have little to nothing to do with the context, and they just use it at their own leisure as kind of a weapon against others. It's like proof texting. If you remember that trend 15, 20 years ago, people would be, you know, they, they would say what you need to do is you need to get a verse. And, and they would start rummaging through the Bible, and they would find a verse that has nothing to do with their problem. The context had nothing to do with their situation and, but it made them feel better, you see. And so they would latch on and they would claim that verse, even though the verse had contextually and scripturally and, and perhaps even principally nothing to do with the problem they were in. And, and that's how people would end up in this proof texting thing. And they would take verses out of context. And there was a saying in seminary 
that a text out of context is a pretext. And so you, you can think about that one again. A text out of context is a pretext. And, and people still uh, do this today. They, they twist the Bible to meet their own ends. They, they take it and they, they make it fit what they want to say and force it to fit. And here Korah is using the words of God as a weapon against others to get his way instead of following God's plan. Rather than it following God's word of, hey, I need to submit, hey, I need to be, you know, I have a special task as a Levite, I, I need to appreciate what I have. No, he went out and said, I'm going to take what God says, I'm going to make what I want, I'm going to make the two work. And friends, Christians are not people who change the Bible to fit themselves. Christians are people who change themselves to fit the Bible. And false teachers are masters of this. False teachers are masters of taking a verse here and a verse there, and, and they take it totally out of context, and they twist it, and they warp it, and they make it say what they want to say, and because people don't know any better, they think it's truth. But it's the teaching of the word in context. It's teaching of the whole counsel of God. And that's why we at this church go through the books of the Bible, you know, line upon line, precept upon precept. Really, it's studying the word in context that gives us strength and maturity and growth. Back to the point, was Israel holy and was the Lord with them? Yes. You know, Moses would have agreed all of Israel was holy in the sense that the, the people were God's private property. They were a peculiar people. I can remember a funeral not so long ago in the church, and we were talking about a lady who loved that verse. She was a peculiar person, and we think of the word peculiar as strange and odd, and, and, and you know, people were remarking on that, but that word peculiar means God's private property. You are owned by the Lord believer. And the idea of us being holy means we are God's private property. We are separated. And they had been set apart, the Israelites here in this time had been set apart as his instrument of service in the world of sin. And the priests, the Levites, the helpers were even further set apart. And they still weren't satisfied. Boy, there, there's a powerful message there. And so we move from this misinterpretation of Scripture now to murmuring, and we see just how wicked the heart is. You know, sometimes we aren't sure. I understand that as a, as a pastor. You know, I'm, I can be pretty cynical at times, uh, but still my pastor's heart gets the better of me at times because I don't want to lose the pastor's heart. I want to give people the benefit of the doubt, even when I smell smoke sometimes. I don't want to repeat what I've seen as errors of other men that I've been around where, you know, they were pretty mean and cold and always running in and making a mess of people's lives. Sometimes we need to leave things in the Lord's hands and see how they work out and how the Lord will work out in their lives. But here, the proof comes out, you know. Sometimes we think to ourselves, oh, we just don't know no better. Oh, sometimes they just, they're unlearned. Sometimes they're just ignorant, you know. Uh, that's not the case. Even, and I believe Second Peter talks about um, where it says, they that are unlearned and ignorant do rest the scriptures as they do others also to the very destruction of their souls. And, uh, well, that's not the case here. They're, they're not ignorant and unlearned, okay? Korah w was not just, uh, you know, what we're saying when people say, when we say they don't know no better, we're saying they're stupid, okay? Literally. And you say, that's, a, that's mean, but it's what we're saying, okay? A lot of times... I think, well, maybe they meant to do better, or hopefully they'll figure it out. Give them some time. But Korah proves here that he's not ignorant. Korah proves here that he's not stupid. Korah proves here that he was a rebel. And that's really what comes out, given enough time. What's really in the heart comes out. And he goes from misinterpreting the word of God to murmuring and complaining about God's plan. And that really is a revealer of the kind of heart that you have in you, listener. You know, why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly in verse 3? Oh, the green-eyed monster of jealousy is oozing out, isn't it? I mean, you can just feel the jealousy coming off the pages of Scripture here. And it's not that he has a role. It's not that he's like nobody. I mean, he has a role. He has a notable place. It tells us here in verse 2, that these are 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. 
And when things go wrong in human relationships, unkind, untrue remarks can fuel the fire. I mean, you will create all kinds of problems, especially in church, when you run your mouth. I mean, it can get you in all kinds of issues. And the unsanctified tongue is a deadly weapon. Notice how much dissension it stirs up in the whole congregation. It's been said that criticism is often nothing more than low-grade envy. I don't think Korah woke up and said, I can't wait to be one of the arch villains in all scripture. I don't think Korah woke up and said, I'm going to be recorded in the Old Testament and the New Testament as being a terrible, wicked, rebellious example of causing problems to God's people. But that's what he did. He's recorded in the book of Jude and in the book of Numbers in terrible, terrible light. And we need to think carefully about that. And you know, he might not have been recorded otherwise. He might have been just a passing footnote. He might not have really been remembered if he just would have faithfully served God, but God would have remembered it. But instead, he got to want something God didn't want for him. And that envy and that jealousy came out, and he went off the rails. And can I give you this? Korah may have been right. Korah may have been as good as Aaron. Korah might have been as skillful. He might have been able to do it with the same way or maybe even better. But here's the way it was wrong because it wasn't God's plan. And that comes into this whole idea of learning to submit to be part of a good leader. Before we get there, I want to tell you about a German man who was taken to court by his ex-wife for half of his property as part of a divorce proceeding. The court ordered him to give half of everything he owned to his wife. And this man made a, a YouTube video, and it shows him cutting up everything he owns in half. It shows him taking a grinder to his television and cutting his iPhone in half. And he literally even cut his car in two. It's an, it's an Opal uh, car, and there's a picture of it cut in two. He took his bicycle and cut it in half. And he put all these things on eBay. And I actually looked for them the other night. They're not for sale anymore, but maybe it's because it's Europe's eBay and not America's either. But he put all of this out there, and he thanked his wife for 12 beautiful years together, saying that she had earned half of the household, and he claimed that she was unfaithful to him. And so he then, in order to give her half of everything, cut everything in half, from an iPhone to a flat-screen TV to an Opal Corsa, which is a car, and all meticulously were sawn in half, and the man is using these tools quite, quite well. Well, here's the thing. I don't think the court was pleased with what he did. That man was angry, and he wanted to send a message. But can I give you this? Do you think that was the right thing to do? Do you think the court would be disappointed with him? I'm sure that he didn't want to give her anything, and I'm sure that he was trying to get back at her. You might actually laugh at, at how he did it. What I'm trying to get at is when you try to do something that isn't in the plan, you're only hurting yourself. And as we think about this, this malcontent, as we think about what's going on here, this, this man, the, these men exhibit the heart of discontent, the heart of not being happy with anything in their lives. And envy oozes out of these men, not content with the important role that God had given them to be sure they were subsidiaries, to be sure that they would have been underlings and, and perhaps not even well known to us in the Bible if they just would have stayed in their lane, if they just would have done right. At best, they would have barely been recorded in the various chronologies but instead they stepped out from under their authority. And friends, that might be your marriage. That might be your parents. That might be your job. That might be your church. You might be under authority, and men, we need to lead the way and do right. Wives, you might have to be a good example to your kids, even when your husband isn't being a good one. Kids, you might need to obey your parents in the Lord, even when your parents aren't the best. You say, well, you know, these parents are awful. If God was doing a better job, you know, God gave them to you for a reason. He makes no mistakes. You can still do right, you know, and even at your job, guys, we should still do right. In our churches, we should still do right. 
you cannot be a good leader until you've learned to be a good follower. And we have to learn to be a servant, and we have to master being a servant. Think about that concept for a minute. Learn to master serving. That's a thought process for you. One of my Bible teachers used to say that the only way to let the Bible, or the only way to master the Bible is to let the Bible master you. And so many times we say, what books do I need to read? What seminars? You know, what, what other preachers can I find, you know, that can help me master the Bible? And the reality is, friends, you need to let the Bible master you rather than you trying to master it. You need to submit to it and trust in it. And we as servants, before you're ever lifted into leadership, we need to learn to serve. And leadership is not about seeking your own pleasure. It's not about doing what you want to do. It's not seeking self-promotion. Leadership is denying self. Leadership is putting others good ahead of self. You know, any leadership that only promotes self, that only engages in self, that only does what's in it for me, I'll only be involved as long as there's something in it for me. I'm only going to be there when it's for me. That is not leadership at all selfishness. And I want to challenge you that will you be involved even when there's nothing in it for you? There was nothing in it for Moses. You go, wait a minute. He's one of the great patriarchs. He's one of the great men of of Israel's history recorded for all his great deeds. Do you think Moses's life was better before he came back for the Israelites or after he got the Israelites? Moses is known for being the meekest man on earth. And even the Israelites drove that man to snap. And before we criticize him too badly, I think I would have snapped long before he did. How bad is envy in your life, believer? Envy in the Bible banished us from paradise. How did Satan tempt Adam and Eve? Oh, when you eat, you'll be like God. It'll be better my way than God's way. Envy. Envy banished us from paradise. Envy turned Cain into a ruthless, cold-blooded murderer of his brother because he was jealous of God's approval in Abel's life. And God even told Cain, if you do good, will you not have reward? But sin lies at the door. What a profound statement. Then what about Joseph? The young brother Joseph, envy made him a slave. And he was sent in slavery, ended up in Potiphar's house. And Moses, the darts of envy come at him but it does not reach the height where Moses was. Can I remind you that when you face discontent, malcontent, the gossiper, the slanderer, the backbiter, the murmurer, that they are fighting God and not you? Those people are fighting God and not you so long as, and only so long as, you are serving God alone. Notice Korah wanted the credit. Korah wanted to be the one in front of everybody. Korah wanted to be the high priest. He was the one who thought he could do so much better because he wanted the credit. Friends, if you do it for the Lord's praise, then man's praise is unnecessary. And if you're doing it for the Lord's praise, then man's criticism will not bother you. But can I give you this? That if you don't get the credit, does it bother you? If you get criticized by man, does it bother you? Man's praise and man's criticism will clearly reveal where your heart is in ministry. I'm not saying it's wrong to be hurt, and I'm not saying that that it won't hurt, but what I'm telling you is that if you're doing it for the Lord, neither one of those is going to deter you. Notice the conclusion in verse 11. It's against the Lord that you all are followers. It's against the Lord that you all followers have banded together, and you all don't know who you're messing with. That's the Don Gray translation of Moses' words there. Moses and Aaron are in God's work because God put them there. They didn't want it. They didn't ask for it. Moses was very eloquent on how he didn't want it. 
You know, and Aaron was pretty reticent too. He was like, I'm not so sure, you know. Those who fight God's servants are really fighting him. We can't stop criticism. And, and you know, people are going to say bad things about us. And sometimes we're like, oh, you know, it hurts so bad. They said this about me, said that about me. You know what one of the guys from my college said? Just do right. Friends, we don't need to respond to people when they say mean things about us. We don't need to respond to mean articles written about us. We don't need to worry about what people say about us. We just need to stay busy serving the Lord. Winston Churchill said in World War II, you all do your worst, we'll do our best. And I want to challenge you as a believer that we need to do our best. And what I mean by that is our best is serving God and living holy lives. Just do right. Just build the wall. Don't listen to what others have to say. Just do the right thing. We can't stop criticism, but we can. We must make sure that we are following the Lord in everything we do. During the meeting of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, one of the members moved that the standing army be restricted to no more than 5,000 men at any one time. George Washington was the chairman. He could not offer a motion, but he turned to another member and whispered sarcastically, amend the motion to provide that no foreign enemy shall invade the United States at any time with more than 3,000 troops. George Washington's point about that, that uh, motion being ridiculous was that it only limits their ability to respond to an enemy's invasion of the United States. As Christians, we find ourselves engaged in a great spiritual battle for the soul. We can know the strategy of our enemy. We can study his tactics. We can see what he does in the lives of others. We can see the trail of destruction that is left in lives that follow him in sin and ruin. What we cannot do is control him. But we can put on the whole armor of God so that we are prepared to fight. Friends, I want to challenge you that I can't, I, I'm, we, we may know what he's up to and we may not be able to foretell for or foresee every little thing, but we know in general what his game plan is. We can't control him. The Lord can. We can't. The Lord gives us armor. The Lord promises us victory. And what I want to challenge you is that we are to be put on the armor and we are called to serve the Lord with joy and with gladness, willingly and all the time. Not for us. We don't do it for us. We must serve God for the privilege and joy of serving him alone. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. We don't merit it. But it is our privilege that God calls us worthy of the fight. Friends, that's our calling. And let's not ever grow weary in following him. To close in a word of prayer. Lord, as we bow before you tonight, we thank you for this time. I pray that this message will go out clearly. I pray that uh, all the issues will have been resolved if it please you. Be with our missionaries, Lord. Uh, be with those traveling. Lord, we know that there are many needs health-wise. We know that there are many things emotionally going on. Lord, we pray for Congress and the Senate this week as there's some very important things going on in our country. Lord, regardless of how we feel uh, about who sits in the office, in the Oval Office, Lord, we know that you sit on the throne. And Lord, we know this life is just a vapor and we trust in you and we ask that whatever happened be pleasing and honoring to you, Lord, be with all the first responders and those on the front lines of this terrible illness, Lord. Just pray that you would help us to live holy lives. Be with those, Lord, that are away from us, that we would long to be near us. But may you be glorified in our life, and may everything we do be honoring and glorifying and putting you first in everything. Help us to live the gospel this year, Lord, not simply talk about it. Because of your son's blood we pray. Amen.